Over the past month, we've explored Europe's robust military capabilities and technologies, illustrating that it is more than capable of self-reliance. We've also delved into the significant economic consequences for the US should it lose Europe's 500 million inhabitants as a military export market. Today, we dive deeper into the naval domain, focusing on the critical systems not covered in last week's episode on surface ships. If you're interested in helicopters, submarines, fast attack craft, and naval weapon systems, then this episode is for you. Today we're going to start by looking at which systems Europe imports a lot of from the US in our navies. And there's no getting around the fact that almost all European navies, except a few like Sweden and Poland's, are very dependent on the Vertical Launch System, or VLS for short. This system is essentially the missile launch tubes seen on many of Europe's destroyers and frigates, and offers both land, sea, and anti-air capability. It seems the Brits and the Swedes have gotten the furthest in their quest for alternatives, and Britain's BAE Systems now produces a direct analogue of the Mark 41 launcher, which is by far the world's most popular naval missile launch system. Sweden, on the other hand, have opted for the older styled launchers directly on deck, which they've successfully sold abroad to, among others, Poland, Germany and Finland, and have recently upgraded their fleet with the British CAM system, rather than the vertical launch system. Interestingly, in a case study of what happens when America alienates and embargoes allies, Turkey has also made their very own variant of the VLS, called Midlas, which is going to be present on the ships Turkey has made for Ukraine. It is still in the early deployment stage, but interestingly Turkey plans to deliver this ITAR free and at a much cheaper price than Lockheed's version. As with their drone technology, Turkey shows what is possible if you have to make your own alternatives. In total, Europe operates around 2,300 cells of the VLS, and the average cost of one 8-cell battery lies somewhere around 20 million euros, without including missiles. So in short, European navies have invested in somewhere along the line of 2.8 billion euros into VLS cells alone. Europe quickly needs to get its act together and build more of their own VLS systems. And while BAE has a decent stopgap, their VLS is made on license from Lockheed Martin, which isn't the best place to be in. Turkey's alternative likely comes with a lot less strings than the American variant. Secondly, America exports a lot of Seahawk helicopters to Europe. Among European nations operating the Seahawk, Denmark's Royal Danish Air Force operates nine Seahawks at an estimated total cost of about 450 million euros. Greece's Hellenic Navy uses 11 S-70 Aegean Hawks and has seven additional MH variants on order, bringing their total to 18 helicopters and an estimated cost of around 900 million. Norway's Norwegian Coast Guard has six on order, which would cost approximately 300 million, while Spain's Navy operates 20 Seahawks and has eight on order, totaling 28 helicopters at an estimated cost of about 1.4 billion euros. Finally, Turkey's naval forces operate 24 Seahawks, with an estimated cost of roughly 1.2 billion. As with many of the items we've gone through in this series, it is not like there's a lack of European alternatives in this bracket. In example, the NH-90, which is now built in over 500 examples and performing well, or the Eurocopter Panther, now made by the very successful Airbus Consortium. In order to get a good overview of the differences in the European naval helicopter market versus the Seahawk, let's do a quick overview of price and capability. The Seahawk, Eurocopter Panther, the AW149, and NH-90 serve distinct roles in naval operations, each reflecting different capabilities and cost implications. The Seahawk family, priced between 28 to 40 million euros per unit, depending on order size and capability, specializes in anti-submarine and anti-surface warfare, equipped with advanced maritime systems suitable for a variety of secondary roles, including search and rescue. In contrast, the Eurocopter Panther, which costs around 15 million euros, is a versatile, multi-role light helicopter, less specialized than the Seahawk, but capable of performing a broad range of tasks from troop transport to medevac and search and rescue at a more economical price point. On the higher end of the spectrum, the NH-90 
costing approximately 40 million euros for its naval version, offers advanced capabilities in both tactical troop transport and naval warfare. Its higher cost is justified by its larger size, sophisticated technology, and flexibility to operate in diverse naval missions, making it one of the most advanced helicopters in its class. It is operated by many of Europe's special forces teams and is likely the premier naval helicopter in the world today. Last but not least, Leonardo's latest AW149 helicopter. Priced at approximately 20 million euros per unit, the AW149 offers a blend of performance and versatility. It is equipped with advanced avionics and systems that enhance its capability to perform a wide range of missions, including troop transport, medevac, search and rescue, and combat operations. The helicopter can carry up to 18 troops or 12 stretchers in its spacious cabin and is powered by two powerful engines that enable it to operate in all weather conditions. With a maximum speed of over 280 kilometers per hour, and a range of about a thousand kilometers, it is one of the most durable choppers on the European list. Third on the US export list to Europe in the naval category is naval air defense, namely the American Sea Sparrow anti-air missile system. Belgium is estimated to have spent roughly 40 to 60 million euros on their Sea Sparrow systems, while Bulgaria's Navy likely invested around 30 million given its smaller scale. Denmark's Royal Danish Navy program is estimated at about 60 million, and Germany's Navy program comes in at roughly 70 million. Greece, operating under both the Hellenic Air Force and Hellenic Navy, is estimated at 60 million. Italy's program, run by the Italian Navy, likely costs around 100 million. The Royal Netherlands Navy's program is estimated at approximately 80 million, and Norway's at about 50 million. Portugal's program is estimated at around 40 million, while Spain's Navy program ranges between 80 to 100 million. Turkey's naval forces are estimated to have spent roughly 40 to 60 million, and Ukraine's emerging Sea Sparrow program, integrated with their self-propelled book systems, is estimated at about 50 million, though I doubt this will get off the ground now that Trump has started urinating on the American defense industry to keep himself warm. As with the Seahawk, there are actually very capable European alternatives. Firstly, likely the most widely adopted European-made naval anti-air missile system is the Principal Anti-Air Missile System, or PAAAMs for short, named Sea Viper in the UK. It's a joint French, Italian and British variant, developed by Eurosam and UCAMS, and fires the very capable Aster missiles, made in Britain, Italy and France. The Esther 30 has a range of 500 kilometers against low-flying targets, while the Aster 15 covers the short-range 30 to 60 kilometer area. Secondly, the French, Brits and Italians have also made what many naval enthusiasts simply call the mushroom farm, or sea scepter system. Utilizing the common anti-air modular missile, this system offers a versatile and much quicker firing solution than the aforementioned Sea Viper. The Sea Scepter has a range of approximately 25 kilometers and is capable of engaging multiple targets simultaneously, thanks to its active radar homing seeker and high-speed response capabilities. Deployed on a variety of ships from frigates to aircraft carriers, the Sea Scepter's vertical launch system allows for 360-degree coverage and rapid reaction times, enhancing fleet protection without the need for extensive modifications to the host ship. Not only is it effective, but it is also cost-efficient, providing significant operational flexibility and formidable defense capabilities to naval fleets around the world. Sweden recently went for this system on their corvettes, and it will also be deployed to most new ships made for the Italian, British and French navies. Based on feedback from our last video, I'm going to start with a class of ships that likely should have had a bigger role last week namely helicopter carriers. With the way warfare is changing, France and Italy in particular are focusing heavily on getting carrier-based variants, which will mainly serve as docking ships for large fleets of drones and helicopters. Most important in this class is the Mistral class from France, and the French Navy currently operates five of this type of ship, 
while the Italians operate one, as we mentioned in the last video. Both these ship classes have a massive hold and is able to act both as a compact aircraft carrier and an amphibious landing craft. Last I heard from my good friends in the French Navy, there is talk of thinking about converting one of their classes into a floating drone factory and hub, meaning that France could potentially park one of these outside somewhere and use it to swarm a front line either indirectly with drones or take a very concentrated drone effort anywhere in the world. Next, we're going to get into what many people have been waiting for, Europe's submarine capabilities. Out of all things naval, this is likely the area where Europe is the strongest. Every single type of submarine is made in Europe, air independent, conventional and nuclear powered. While Sweden and Germany are experts at creating the most silent submarines in the world, France and Great Britain makes nuclear submarines which can go toe to toe with any other long range submarine in the world. First, let's start with Sweden's quite frankly enormous submarine heritage for such a small country. Sweden's Gotland class submarines are world famous, not only for their capability, but also for their extreme stealth characteristics. Along with the Dutch and German AIP variant submarines, they are known for being able to completely evade US carrier group's so-called impenetrable ring around its aircraft carriers. In 2005, during exercises off the coast of California, the Gotland repeated this success over and over, even if the US group was prepared for the attack. The shallow waters of the Baltic Sea means that Sweden has a long history of having to have submarines which are extremely stealthy in order to remain hidden. Saab's next submarine, the A26, is going to build on this capability and will likely be the first Swedish submarine to be an export success. Now, in the conventional air independent space, Germany, Italy and France produces extremely capable variants, though it is perhaps Germany and Italy which has seen the most success with their A212 submarines made by Fincantieri and Thyssenkrupp. While not as quiet as the Swedish air independent Stirling engines, these submarines are bigger and better armed. Norway recently placed an order for six of these submarines and will likely have the first in service by 2029, complete with naval strike missiles made in Norway. France, on the other hand, produces the Barracuda, or Souffren class in French, and it originally seemed like France would export this to Australia, but then America used its diplomatic muscle and got that decision changed to the AUKUS program instead. France's naval group recently won the bid for the next Dutch submarine variant with this class. Let's move up a level to Europe's nuclear-powered submarines. Both Britain and France operate several classes of these submarines. Let's start with the British. The Astute class submarines are a series of nuclear-powered fleet submarines serving in the Royal Navy and are regarded as some of the most advanced submarines in the world. These vessels, built by BAE Systems, represent a significant technological leap in submarine design, featuring a nuclear reactor that does not require refueling for the vessel's entire 25-year service life. Equipped with sophisticated sonar capabilities and armed with Tomahawk cruise missiles and spearfish torpedoes, the Astute class can engage targets up to 1,500 kilometers away while submerged. They are designed for a variety of tasks, including anti-ship and anti-submarine warfare, intelligence gathering and supporting land operations. Their stealth capabilities are enhanced by a specially designed hull that minimizes acoustic signatures, making these submarines extremely difficult to detect, a crucial advantage in modern naval warfare. The only thing I think Britain will need to consider is these subs use of American hardware, now that Trump is showing that he can't be trusted to allow users of American armaments to actually use them if push comes to shove. Last but not least in the submarine category, likely the most important weapons at Europe's disposal in these very unstable times. Britain and France both operate sophisticated nuclear armed submarines as central pillars of Europe's defense and nuclear deterrence strategies. The United Kingdom's Vanguard class submarines are equipped with Trident II D5 ballistic missiles, providing a continuous at sea deterrent. Each submarine in this class is capable of carrying up to 16 missiles, each armed with multiple nuclear warheads, ensuring the UK's capability to deliver a retaliatory strike if necessary. Similarly, 
France's triumphant class submarines serve as the backbone of its, pardon my French, Force Océanique Stratégique. These submarines are equipped with the newer M51 missiles, which are also capable of carrying multiple nuclear warheads and offer an extended range compared to their predecessors. Both nations' submarines are designed for stealth and survivability, with advanced sonar systems and noise reduction technologies to evade detection, underscoring their roles in securing national security through a credible, sea-based nuclear deterrent. I think I speak for the rest of Europe here when I say how thankful I am that we've got the UK and France to at least offer enough damage to anyone who tries anything that it won't be worth invading us. Macron's ideas about extending the nuclear umbrella of France to other nations is a great initiative, and I'm sure that everyone will pool together to help France and the UK to maintain these systems. I know leaving nuclear-armed submarines to talk about missile boats and fast attack craft probably feels like a bit of a downer, but let me just show you these last few amazing vessels. Considering that the line between fast attack craft and missile boats is often blurred, I'm going to merge these two categories. And with the utmost humble attitude, I'm going to put one of Finland's naval assets in the first spot here at the risk of losing my citizenship. The Hamina-class missile boat, which in all reality should likely be classed as a corvette, is one of the heaviest hitters in its category. It couples amazing stealth capability with purely European-made technology. Its decks are stacked with RBS-15 batteries, and it can travel at great speeds with its Rolls-Royce engine. Its main purpose is ducking in and out of the many inlets in the Baltic Sea and striking much larger Russian assets with its heavy missile payload. And who could mention fast attack craft without mentioning Sweden's Combat Boat 90, likely one of Sweden's biggest military export successes? It currently operates in eight different countries and is a special favorite of Naval Special Forces squads in among others, Norway, Greece, Germany and Ukraine. Naturally, both Finland and Sweden are great producers of this kind of craft due to the very island-heavy shallow waters of the Baltic Sea, and therefore I'll have to mention the new Swedish-Finnish cooperation 24M, which essentially is a fast attack craft strapped with a big Patria mortar on top which can fire while moving. It blends Sweden's great fast attack craft heritage and Finnish mortar technology to deliver an almost autonomous turret fixed on a boat which can travel at extreme speeds while firing. I could go on for a while in this category. Many nations make great fast assault and attack craft, including France, the UK, Germany, Netherlands, Italy, but the CB-90 is likely the most exported variant in this class. And as far as I gather, several of Europe's large naval powers are considering it for their special forces as we speak. And that's all the time I have this week. If you want me to continue this series next week with all the other bits I have not covered, like air power outside of fighter jets, logistical assets and satellite technology, let me know in the comments below. I'll leave the other episodes in this series in the comments and description, and we've also created a playlist if you'd like to watch them all without looking for them. As always, have a great weekend, and remember that Europe and its free world allies are strong, even without Donald Trump's wannabe authoritarian USA.